Chicago. I'm going to try and make nature work for me. Big gust of wind right now. Okay, maybe not. On the left-hand side, uh, those three flags that are there. There's one uh, that is the flag of Chicago. In fact, this man has a shirt with the flag. Show everybody right there. There you are. Audience participation. This has four red stars, two blue stripes, three white stripes. Uh, the four red stars and the flag of Chicago are supposed to symbolize in the city's history, really important events. Uh, the first star is uh, the uh, settlement of Fort Dearborn back in 1803. That was our first military settlement. Uh, number two, the Great Chicago Fire in 1871. Uh, the third star is the World's Fair, the Columbian Exposition of 1893. And the fourth star is the World's Fair of 1933, a century of progress. Uh, that World's Fair of 1893, huge event for us, uh, for the whole world. Uh, the World's Fair, this is where you had new innovations unveiled for the very first time. Uh, that World's Fair of 1893 was the first fair that was completely powered by electricity. First of its kind. Uh, also the very first time that anybody enjoyed Paps Blue Ribbon Beer, PBR. We got applause. activity. Uh, so you would have found inside that 
building, there was an elevator they could just drive your car into. And it would take you, your car, and your valuables up to wherever you were storing them. And this seems really safe, except for the fact that the dome on the top of the building was also a speakeasy. It was known as the Stratosphere Lounge, and guess who owned it? Al Capone. So they were worried about their jewels being stolen. Al Capone was on the top of that building, dancing the fun strut, twerking. He loved to twerk. True fact. On the right hand side, we're going to see Marina City. You guys already took photos of this. We have these two corn cob buildings right here that have uh, apartments and parking, but it's much more than just residential. This is a multi purpose property. You've got restaurants, you've got a marina. You want to go see a show, there's a house of blues on your property. If you feel like going bowling, there's a bowling alley on here also. This is a city within a city. And that was the purpose of it. I don't want to think about how much it is. Way more than my pay grade. Uh, so this idea of a city within a city was born uh, to combat the fact that you had a lot of people leaving downtown Chicago. In the 1930s to the 1960s, a lot of people leaving downtown Chicago, uh, moving out to the boroughs of the today. So this idea of a city within a city was worth the way So first building ever to have its own zip code. inside. The reason why there's train tracks on the other side. So the building can't build out any further or else it's on top of the train tracks. So what do you find inside the garage? Something very similar to the jeweler's building. You drive your car into the garage, an elevator will take you and your car up to wherever you're parked at. This is a constant theme in Chicago. We're going to see some examples of it. On the left hand side though, this pink building, this is a Fulton house. Dating back from 1908, this was a big ice box, a cold storage facility. It was turned into residential in the 1970s. They had to wait a year for that building to thaw out before they could do any work to it. The guy responsible for spearheading that project designed these buildings on the left, these riverside cottages. See all the triangles on here? Yeah. The whole building in the form of a triangle. That's because the architect, Harry Weiss, was not just an architect, but a sailor. The guy loved nothing more than being out on his boat. So he uses triangles in every single one of his designs just because it rem uh, reminds him of sailboats. In fact, that beneath this river ran a system of tunnels. These tunnels were used in the early 1900s to transport coal from building to building for heating purposes, also uh, for telephone cables. Uh, and they connected the buildings in downtown Chicago. So as you can imagine, they dug down one of these pilings right next to the wall of one of these tunnels, which created a crack. Water began to seep in, and within a week, the basements of a lot of these buildings in downtown Chicago were flooded. The streets were flooded. The city had to shut down for a week, all trade and business. The Great Chicago Flood of 1992. But here's where the story gets really good. After this flood, these property owners looked at the insurance policies. Turns out floods were not covered, but leaks were. And somehow, they got this whole flood to be classified as a leak. Uh, so the insurance policies would cover the damages. So it's known as the Great Chicago Leak of 1992. Well, there's a will, there's a way in this city. Uh, now we are passing by this convergence once more where the river meets. We did the main branch. These shades did not make it look so cloudy out. Uh, we just did the main branch uh, and the north branch. We're going to go down the south branch of the Chicago River. Uh, see a lot of beautiful buildings. My favorite building is on the left-hand side. That green building right there, it's called the Nuveen Building, or 333 West Wacker. You notice how the building's kind of curved? And the glass is tinted green? Great example of something known as contextualism. Our breathing algae, which is a sign of a healthy river system. 
see another example of contextualism a little bit later on in this work. But coming up on the right hand side, we're going to have the Boeing building, that gray building right there. Dating back from 1891. Uh, originally, it was home to Morton Salt. Uh, Morton started right here in Illinois. Uh, in fact, if we were to continue a bit farther up the North Branch, we would find a refinery plant. Um, you may be thinking, what do we know about salt? We have a huge body of fresh water surrounding us. If you go underneath Lake Michigan, the third largest of all five great lakes, you will find one of the world's largest salt deposits. All that salt under Detroit. Now, what I like to point out about the building is the shape that it has. It's got this L shaped design that a lot of people would attribute to the fact that the guy who financed that thought he owned Chicago. And that was supposed to be his throne over the city. His name's Samuel Insull. Uh, he owned what is now ComEd, or Commonwealth Edison. That's our electricity provider. This guy owned the elevated train. Before the CTA became the CTA, uh, there were four train lines. He owned every single one of them. He owned the utilities. He thought he owned the city. But that's not the reason for that setback. We find setbacks like that in nearly every building here in Chicago. On the left-hand side, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange has, uh, has a setback right in the middle of the building. These setbacks are due to zoning codes. One passed in 1917, the other in 1923. They mandated that every single building in this city that reaches past a certain height has to have a setback in its design to allow for the maximum amount of natural light and fresh air to pass through the buildings, down to the street. We had a rare opportunity. After the Great Chicago Fire, we had a second chance to rebuild. Something that not a lot of cities get to do. And we took full advantage. We saw other great cities, saw things that could have been, uh, could have been slightly improved upon. New York, for instance. 1996, opening day, everyone's gathered around the garage, waiting to see the first truck roll in. The truck rolls in, and it gets stuck at the entrance. <laughs> Apparently they forgot to measure the tires on the trucks for the clearance in the garage. So it's rumored that for a week they had to go through this process of deflating the tires, pushing the trucks in, inflating the tires, getting the mail, and doing the same thing on the way out for a week until they added more clearance. Now it works fine though. Uh, they have color-coded bays inside the garage so the trucks know where they have to go for their mail deliveries. Uh, coming up on the left-hand side, we're going to have some riverfront property. You all remember Marina City? Corn cob buildings? City within a city? Same kind of Bertram Goldberg. As you've seen today, Architects can sometimes have their obsessions, right? Harry Weiss loves sailing so much, he uses triangles in all of his designs. Bertrand Goldberg says her firemen are trained. Ironic, because that was also where the Great Chicago Fire started. That very point. And they had this monument that commemorates it. So I'm going to tell you all the story of the Great Chicago Fire. And lucky for you, you have one of the only docents with a theater degree. Surprise, surprise. Uh, what's that mean? I got a lot of student loans to repay for a degree that's honestly useless. Uh, but I know accents, so <laughs> who's laughing now, high school guidance counselor? I guess you still are. All right, here we go. In the wee hours of the morning, October 8th, 1871, Mrs. O'Leary went up to Milk Cow and seen Irish accent. 300,000 people, and miraculously enough, just over 300 people lost their lives. The casualties could have been a lot worse than what they were. But out of those ashes, we rose like a phoenix. That was a semester of modern dance that I took. Pretty proud of that. And we had a second chance to rebuild uh, the second city they see in front of you today. So that's where that nickname comes from, the second city. That actually comes from our second chance, our rebirth. And as far as Mrs. O'Leary and her cow goes, I hate to break it to you, but the whole thing was made up. Uh, during that time, there was a lot of hate towards the Irish population, so it was kind of easy for people to put the blame on Mrs. O'Leary, because her barn was the starting point. That part of the story is true. 
Uh, as far as what actually started the fire, that's what no one really knows. There's a lot of theories. Beneath you and the glass at your feet starts to shatter. That happened a couple weeks ago. Some people went inside the sky deck. They thought the glass beneath them was shattering was actually the protective coating. Uh, I'm sure they didn't care what it was at that point they were getting inside of those boxes. Uh, the sky deck supports uh, upwards of five tons worth of weight, so it is very safe if you want to get over your heights. Now, if you think that's all, take a look at the Sears Tower picture of the Sears Tower on top of it. If you can manage to do that, and that's how tall the Burj Khalifa is. Tallest building in the world, located in Dubai, over 2,000 feet tall. That's one and a half Sears Towers, designed by the same architectural firm responsible for the Sears. Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill. Passing by Marina City once again, as we talked about, Bertrand Goldberg got his inspiration from nature. You look at the balconies on here, they kind of look like flower petals. Would it surprise you to find out that Bertrand Goldberg, this guy who hated right angles and straight lines, his mentor responsible for that black building that sits right next to him on the left hand side. We are looking at the AMA Plaza, formerly known as the IBM building. It is also one of the very last designs of Mr. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. And he is considered to be by some the father of modernism. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe was the founder of the School of Bauhaus in Germany in the 1930s. His school of thought was seen as being extreme by the Nazi party. So you had a lot of architects 